without further ado, let's get to the reason we're all here tonight. I'm super excited to have Aaron speaking here. Um, we were actually going, he lives in Atlanta. That's one of the advantages of doing this online. We were trying to figure out when's he going to be in the Bay Area. And um, a lot of the travel and conferences got canceled. So we accelerated and moved it up and had it, the timing worked out great with the second edition of his book coming out. So his book is Designing for Emotion. I'm a big fan of his book. I'm, I referenced that framework um, that he creates in my book and in my talks often when we talk about MVPs. He is currently the VP of Design Publishing and Education at InVision. Before that, he was the head of UX Design at MailChimp. I was a huge, I, I used MailChimp in the early days and I was a big fan of that product. That's such an amazing UX, so I'm not surprised that Aaron wrote this book. And his Twitter handle is at Aaron. Um, so if you do, you know, feel free to take a screenshot of any slide that you like and, and tweet it. But um, without further ado, let me introduce Aaron. Aaron, welcome. And if you want to take over and uh, share your screen, that'd be great. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, bear with me for one second while we get all set up here. Thanks for coming out. Um, I want to talk to you about the intersection of uh, design and psychology and uh, designing for emotion. It's a topic I've been thinking about for um, quite some time. Uh, the first edition of my book came out in um, 2011, and I, I was in a, a very different mental space at the time. Um, you know, I've been in this business um, for 20 some years, and I know that when I got into the world of the web, um, it felt like, you know, entering a revolution. And if you are a student of history like I am, you know that um, revolutions often start with really great ideals um, and a lot of positive energy. And at a certain point, there comes a moment of reckoning where we have to consider, um, you know, how our ideals actually um, uh, enter the world and what are the impacts of what they create. Um, and it feels like we're encountering something very similar um, right now with the web. Um, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web, has even said on uh, this uh, interview with uh, Vanity Fair, um, you know, we demonstrated that the web had failed instead of served humanity as it was supposed to have done and failed in so many places. The increasing centralization of the web ended up producing with no deliberate action of the people who designed the platform, a large scale emergent phenomenon, which is anti-human. And just today we saw um, advertisers boycotting and, and in conversation and debate with Facebook. Um, we see a lot of uh, social upheaval at uh, this moment in the world. The world really feels upside down and the pandemic is the great amplifier of what was already present in the world, inequity. Um, all of us are feeling a lot of heavy emotions right now. I know I am, um, I'm, a, I'm a parent, you know, I've got kids and I know that they're um, feeling a lot of emotion right now too. Um, entering into this business of the web, of design, of products, um, we, we come into it with really good intentions, regardless of your discipline. We wanna make things that creates a positive world. But as, at a certain point, um, there is that gap between our good intentions and what we actually create. So when I first wrote Designing for Emotion back in 2011, the model that Dan referred to um, looks like this. Uh, let's build products that are functional and reliable and usable. And let's go a step further. Let's learn from other disciplines that precede us industrial design, architecture, so many others. Let's make something that feels delightful, that is pleasurable, that um, is beyond just being you know, a simple utilitarian thing. But uh, that, those, that was the, the ideal of the revolution in my mind. And today I feel a lot more skeptical, a lot more introspective about what we're doing. I still wanna make functional, reliable, and usable products for, to serve our audiences. But I also recognize that designing for delight falls woefully short. There's a whole lot more that we should be considering in what we're making. Um, consider uh, you know, the emotions of a person who's logging into their 401k during a bear market and seeing it tumble and wondering, am I gonna be able to retire? Consider the feeling of people who feel unseen or unincluded um, and our products because we've been um, 
not not very we haven't we haven't carefully considered um, inclusivity in, in the way that we approach our work there's so many different emotions that we feel right now um, as I said the pandemic's an amplifier um, we should just be thinking about designing for not just for delight but for all emotions going forward so how do we get there how do we get started well it feels nebulous. It feels like a big problem to think about all the emotions that people bring to the products that we create. But any big problem is best solved by cutting it into smaller pieces. So I always recommend that we start by thinking about moments. We think about a customer journey and along that, the, that customer journey, there's careful consideration about timing. When a moment might show up where we could recognize um, the, the emotion of, of our audience um, that they might be experiencing and respond to that with some sort of engaging moment. Timing, as, in, as it is uh, true with comedy, is, is everything um, with emotional design. When we think about the customer journey, we think about you know, uh, satisfaction and experience through time. There are peaks and valleys you know, that um, it's kind of in the middle, you're, you're satisfied. Um, in the valleys, it's really clunky, it's confusing. Perhaps it's a really painful onboarding flow that um, causes people to get, get lost. Um, or it's a complicated form that has a ridiculous uh, password requirement that doesn't let someone use um, their, their password manager uh, as it's intended to. And then there, there are these peak moments where um, someone feels empowered, they're using our software, they feel successful, um, and that's another place that we can consider in this customer journey where we could time uh, an emotionally designed moment um, very well. Let's, like, let's take a look at a, a valley moment when things are at its worst. Um, since you know, we're talking about Intuit, Dan mentioned them early on. Um, uh, sort of coincidence, I'm, I'm citing their work, but uh, they're, they're very thoughtful about their approach um, to moments, and they think about emotional design in a very holistic way. This example, um, you know, filing your taxes, let's be honest, it sucks. It's not a fun thing to do, but it's especially troubling when you are doing it after you've lost a spouse, and um, the circumstances of that, that filing have really changed. So, you know, designing that workflow um, where, you know, you have to ask that question, has anything uh, changed in the past year uh, that's different with this filing and your user indicates that someone's passed away, um, that's, that can trigger um, a lot of emotion, a lot of sadness, a feeling of loss. There's a simple message in that process in TurboTax. Uh, just says, you know, we're sorry to hear about your loss. You can count on us to help you get the, your uh, tax return, their tax return, return done right. It's a really small thing. It's just acknowledging the humanity of the moment. Um, we could say like, you know, um, okay, great. We'll enter that information here. If we were thinking about designing for delight, we would approach this in a very ham-fisted way. We would approach it in a way that we never would in, uh, you know, a human uh, context. If we were interacting with that person one on one, has a pretty profound impact on customers. Here's one customer who wrote in and said, I finally got around to doing taxes yesterday. After our information was transferred from last year's return, it asked if either of us had passed away, and I entered the information that my husband had died on June 15th. And a screen came up that said, We're sorry for your loss. You know, I sat there and stared at it crying for a few minutes. It was so cathartic. Please pass on to the team how much that one little sentence meant to me. Whoever thought that up must be a very caring person. So when we think about the idea of designing for emotion, it's not a complicated um, process. It doesn't have to be um, a, a, a very time intensive process. It's about thinking about emotional context along the way when people are using your product. Um, and we get that emotional context by talking to customers, by interacting with customers, watching them use our products. Um, you know, this is kind of the age old adage that 
um, customer exposure helps us build better products. TurboTax and the Intuit team, they call these ownable moments instead of moments of delight. And, and there is that, that um, axiom that's been in the history of, of Intuit for a number of years since its founding that um, designed for delight. But this is a reframing of that idea of creating ownable moments, a moment where we recognize what's happening. We know where this is in the customer journey. Is it a peak? Is it a valley? We can own that moment and do something that's thoughtful. Garen Ingstrom used to be on that, that TurboTax uh, team, and he wrote, emotional design is, it's not just about delight and positive emotion. In reality, emotional design is about all emotion, good and especially bad. If the user's feeling uncertain or feel, uh, feeling fearful, don't shy away from that or sweep it under the rug. Instead, lean into that emotion. Let the user know that you understand where they're emo uh, where they are emotionally and offer a way to put them at ease. You can also think about those peak moments. These are the moments that we're a bit more familiar with and um, they're, they're a lot of fun to design for. In fact, the reason why I'm interested in this topic of the intersection of design and psychology, of thinking about emotion and product design, and I um, believe very deeply that emotional design is a way to create competitive advantage and superior experiences for our customers is because of this experience right here, the high five from MailChimp. As Dan said, um, I led the design team at MailChimp. I was uh, one of the, the, the first people hired and I was the, the first designer hired other than the CEO um, back in 2008. And I was given a unique opportunity, just amazing freedom to experiment and explore in the product. And I was a customer. I had been using MailChimp for a long time. And I recognized that the, 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 the customer journey of creating an email of writing and designing and like kind of coordinating everything with everyone, um, it was intense. It took a lot of, of time and energy. Um, so when I got, got it done, when the task was completed, I just wanted someone to high five me. Actually, I wanted someone to hand me a beer, but I don't think I could design a product that uh, a person you know, could reach out of the screen and hand you a beer. So um, you know, wrote a little piece of, of copy that was just like, you know, high five, you did it. Your email's been ushered into the queue, it's going out. Um, it looks roughly like this. Um, that ended up being a very profound experience for a lot of people um, that drove uh, a lot of word of mouth, uh, you know, lots of people talking about it on social media, on Twitter, and so forth. It was a simple thing, but it's really about recognizing that peak moment. Uh, you can high five Freddie. Uh, Freddie is the chimp, uh, male chimp, and as you continue to high five him, his hand gets redder and redder, um, which uh, actually leads to uh, a game and, and lots of other fun things. Um, lots of reaction on um, so many different places. People high-fiving their screen, literally high-fiving their screen, literally knocking over their iMac from it. Um, and, you know, it continues if you, if you uh, Google MailChimp High Five, um, what's been written about it, tweeted about it, it's just, it's endless. So um, recognizing these peak moments and these valley moments is really key um, to thinking about emotional design. It's a way for us to Think about this, this practice, not as uh, you know, a, a huge thing that we have to add to our process, but as a small thing that we can recognize and um, connect with people on. Turns out there's a lot of science behind the idea of designing moments. Um, uh, Daniel Kahneman, you probably know uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, and you might know his TED Talks and his uh, partner, Amos Tversky did an interesting study on colonoscopies that you didn't think you'd spend your evening uh, listening to someone talk about colonoscopies. Um, they, they did a study, these, these two doctors, um, of people um, having to get a painful procedure and um, discovered something called the peak end rule. Um, in a nutshell, what happens is um, you've got two different groups of people. Um, one group has a, a shorter 11 minute procedure that ends with a painful moment and then it's over. And group B has a longer procedure, but the last couple moments of that procedure are not painful. They're just uncomfortable. And um, so, but, but they have to go through that for a longer period of time. Group B that had the longer um, procedure 
but didn't have all the pain at the ending, um, had a very different experience. In fact, they remembered it in a more positive way. So Kahneman thought about this more deeply and um, identified what he calls the experiencing self, that is the self of the moment. This is what my body is feeling. The, these are the senses I'm feeling, the emotions um, that are currently active, and then the remembering self. So um, the remembering self often uh, colors an experience very differently from what the experiencing self um, uh, ex uh, experiences. Um, the remembering self uh, encodes memory um, for long term. So we can remember those things that are positive and those things are negative that, and, and we can avoid them. Um, and that last little piece greatly influenced the remembering self. If the last piece, the freshest part in the, mem in the, the, the mind, the memory, um, if that was not as, as negative, then it was uh, encoded in, in a very different way. So when we think about designing for moments, we can think about this peak end rule and design that customer journey. Um, you know, we can think about the, the valleys and the peaks and, and, and so forth. But if we think about the moment, the first moment that we want to try to tackle um, as we start to bring designing for emotion into our practice, thinking about that at the end um, can have a very positive effect um, in people remembering a great thing about your product. Personality is also a really powerful piece of the puzzle when we think about designing um, for emotion. Um, and there are a lot of products that bring brand personality into what they're designing. One of my favorite examples is um, Headspace. Headspace is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a product that I use on a regular basis and I really like it the more I use it. Um, it's a difficult space to enter because you know, the idea, it's almost um, incongruous to think that a phone would give you mindfulness. In fact, most of the time, a phone is doing the opposite. It is distracting us. Um, it's, it's taking us away from a moment. Uh, but Headspace have managed to create a product that connects people to a moment. Um, and they had to overcome this challenge that the idea of mindfulness um, especially in Western culture, it, it's like this, you know, it's like um, monks uh, taking a vow um, of austerity and uh, devoting themselves to some deep cause. And, um, you know, there might be deprivation that's part of that. It doesn't feel like the thing that is mainstream. So having to overcome that, that perception in creating a new product is a very, very difficult task. But they've been successful with it um, primarily by bringing a lot of personality to the product. Um, what happens inside the product as you use it is there's a little bit of disarming. Yeah, there's some playfulness to this, but the playfulness is, is, has purpose. It's not just like silliness and goofiness. And in fact, the goofiness kind of um, fades into the background as you use the product more. It's about admitting our imperfection that, yeah, I, I'm, my mind is everywhere. It's just like, it's chaos. And I have a hard time sitting down and focusing and I create stress. I'm doing this thing to try to reduce stress. It's actually creating stress. Anna Charity, who is the former um, head of design for Headspace describes it this way. She said that the mind is a complex place and it's always an easy place, uh, and it isn't always an easy place to inhabit, which is why meditation is so valuable. Um, we knew we had to develop a style that translated these ideas in an approachable and relatable way. Animation and illustration became integral to the brand. By using characters and storytelling, we could break down the barriers of a tough subject matter and present it in a lighthearted but sensitive way. Characters are a great vehicle to represent the weirdness inside your head. It feels playful and memorable as a result. Um, I love that even their logo, which looks at first glance like a perfect circle uh, in that orange of the Sangha, the Buddhist Sangha, um, it looks perfect, but um, it's animated in the product in an imperfect way. And it's kind of like moving much like the mind that is an imperfect place. 
It's a very thoughtful approach to design that influences emotional perception and um, breaks down the barriers that and preconceptions that people have bringing to this product. So personality, it influences perceptions. And sometimes it can be used with a lot of humor, um, as is the case with uh, this product, uh, this, this company, Gooder. They make sunglasses. They sell sunglasses. But of course, so, so does every CVS and Walgreens on the planet. Uh, Gooder does it a little gooder than other people. Uh, they tell stories around each one of their products and the stories have a sense of humor that create uh, a way for people to connect with the identity, uh, or, you know, connect their identity with the identity of the product. Um, so we see, you know, uh, funny pictures, but also really interesting uh, copy that's written around each one of these products. Um, they're inexpensive glasses. If you lose them, it's not like, you know, it's the end of the world because uh, they're, they're so cheap to buy. You can buy them like a bunch of them. Um, but it turns out that uh, writing great stories about these products makes them sell better, uh, makes them more attractive, and makes them more memorable. And once again, there's science behind this. Uh, Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker, two researchers, did a fascinating experiment. Um, they call it significant objects. So they and a team of their researchers, um, they went out to various uh, kind of junk shops, antique stores, and bought uh, a total of $128 of tchotchkes, random objects um, that, you know, nothing really special or significant about them. But they went about making them significant by having their team write stories about each one of these objects. And then they listed them on eBay and had a 28X return on investment. So they made 300, uh, I'm sorry, $3,612.51 from their $128 investment. Um, what's the moral of the story? The, the moral of the story is that storytelling is a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool that can be used in a humorous way as we saw with Gooder. Um, it can be used in a really powerful, sublime way, like Patagonia, um, who have storytelling at the heart of their brand and all of they do, uh, all that they do and their causes. Um, so storytelling can be a, a powerful part of our emotional design toolkit. And as we think about personality, um, I'll admit I have toyed with the edges of personality when uh, in those early days at MailChimp and exploring brand personality. And I found the edge multiple times of where too much uh, personality turned out to be too much for the product. And um, I, I think there's a fantastic uh, guide of uh, what's inbounds and out of bounds that comes from an unlikely place. Um, Maybe it's not so unlikely, but it's um, from Slack's developer uh, API documentation. A lot of people are producing um, products or services built on top of the Slack platform. And Slack gives a really great example of like, not like this. Here's, you know, three sentences, basically a very long uh, protracted paragraph to try to get to like a sense of humor and personality in this, this cowgirl cooker product on top of Slack. It's a chat bot. Uh, more like this, howdy partner, ready to schedule your cookout. There's personality there, but it's not getting in the way of anything else. When we think about the hierarchy of needs, one layer of that hierarchy should not um, uh, overshadow another. Slack API documentation here. Don't construct a personality that means you have to add sentence upon sentence in order to get uh, to a joke in keeping with your bot's sense of humor. No one cares, get to the point. That's right. So um, we always wanna think about um, customer needs and sometimes you know a little bit of humor lightens the moment if that's a peak moment um, and sometimes it gets in the way. So we need to be cognizant of uh, where those edges are. I'm going to toss a, talk about trust and fear, uh, which feels very salient in, um, in the world today, um, and how we might design for these two really negative emotions that are prevalent um, in, in us all. 
trust is not necessarily a negative emotion, but mistrust is, is, uh, is prevalent. Fascinating example to me is Airbnb. Um, central to the success of their product and their brand is the trusting relationship that needs to take place between a host and a guest. To let someone stay in your home, uh, you need to feel safe that they are someone who is trustworthy, that um, is not going to take advantage um, or harm anyone um, in your family or at your house. Because that's so central, they've taken a very thoughtful, different approach that I haven't seen at any other company. I'll admit, they haven't always gotten it right, and they would also admit that they haven't gotten it right. I admire that greatly about Brian Chesky, their co-founder and CEO, that um, he's not afraid to, to step up and say when, when the company's made mistakes. Um, they, they map trust across the entire customer journey, the customer experience. Because uh, each team, uh, that's, they have teams organized around different stages of that, that customer journey. And each team has to know what's, what's at stake and what they're doing. Where trust tends to dip and where it tends to go up. Um, and be cognizant of the, the design decisions that they're making, the product decisions that um, could, could potentially impact that, that trust. Um, more about them in a little bit here. I want to talk about um, Wealth Simple is another example where trust is so uh, essential. Um, Wealth Simple is essentially a uh, um, an AI investing platform um, that you know you can put money in and it will um, invest in broad based index funds for you and um, help you build a, a nice little nest egg. Um, they're entering this financial space where um, the idea of trust is um, it's hard to come by because a lot of us feel mistrustful. Um, we, you know, fresh in our minds is our experience with Wells Fargo um, and, you know, creating false accounts um, and, and a number of other things that happen there. Um, I bet all of us probably have some bad story about interacting with a bank um, where things didn't work out so well for you, didn't feel like they had your, your best, um, uh, you know, your intentions in mind. Uh, Rudy Adler, who's the head of design over there, he said, you know, banks are so distrusted because they have a very confusing way of talking about things and presenting fees. It's almost like their business model is purposely confusing. We know that what we do is different. It's hard to explain automated invest in, investing to someone who's never heard the phrase automated investing before, let alone to someone who's never invested a penny. We wanted to make a site that provided information as simply, clearly, and beautifully as possible. And we wanted to, uh, a central metaphor that was fun, elegant, um, and the opposite of tech confusing. Uh, this is what their site looks like. Um, it's, uh, it's so beautifully produced, so there's a lot of craftsmanship to it. Um, I naively asked Rudy, how did you guys build these Rube Goldberg machines? And he said, actually, it's just really uh, amazing animation. Uh, it just looked very real. Um, so it's a little ironic that they're using the, the complexity of a Rube Goldberg machine to make uh, a complex thing feel more accessible. But what's happening here is um, there's sort of like this sense of trust that is almost subconscious. The level of care and polish that goes into the production of this, this site and their, their products um, gives us this, the implication, the, the suggestion that if they're putting this much time and energy and careful thought into uh, just the marketing website, the product must have equally careful consideration behind the scenes. Speaking of designing for trust and fear, um, one thing that's fascinating about how they design their dashboard is when you log in, the time scale of your investments is expanded out, more like a telescope than a microscope. Uh, when we look at the stock market app on our phone, uh, it, generally it shows you very recent history, like in the, in the past 
30 days, maybe 60 or 90. The problem is that when you go through an economic downturn, and that's the extent of your visibility of your investments, it looks like the sky's falling. The sky's kind of falling, but the sky also will, will pick back up. Um, when you show, when you make a design decision to design a, a, an investment dashboard that shows a wider scale, you're thinking about fear. You're thinking about the fear of that moment of feeling like everything you've invested is now lost, um, but it's not lost. The, the history of the stock market that, that we have uh, to date is that it tends to go up and to the right. And so showing people that can help them, can help deter negative behavior, which is selling in a bear market, which, which is when we lose um, value the most. I want to talk about inclusion and empathy, um, which is a very important uh, part of design. And I think it's uh, even more uh, visible to us today. Uh, Boywin Gao and Jahan Manton, who run Project Inkblot, have built a really amazing framework that is uh, a powerful tool that we can bring into our product design process to think more inclusively and think about the gap between our good intentions that we bring to our work and the outcomes uh, of what we make. That gap between the ideals of the revolution and the unintended consequences of the evolution of an idea, um, they're, they're doing a great job of, uh, their framework helps us see that gap. The framework consists of a series of questions that um, are easy to bring into your practice. Question number one is, what's the worst case scenario of the product that we're designing and on whom? What's the worst case scenario and on whom? So earlier we talked about um, how Airbnb has uh, this trust map that they've mapped out, but they've had, you know, I, I know a lot of people over there who are smart um, and talented and good people who want to do really great things. Um, but we, we make mistakes sometimes. Um, in trying to build trust, uh, indexing on trust, they designed a host guest interaction system where uh, they showed faces and names um, uh, to, of, uh, of the, the person requesting the booking to the host. And that played into unintended racist consequences where uh, African-Americans uh, got denied bookings, uh, still get uh, denied bookings more than um, uh, white people. And that's led to interesting innovation. They've seen it and they've recognized it and they're, they've built a framework to um, help identify that, which they're open sourcing to lots of other teams to use as well. But this question, what's the worst case scenario on, on, and on whom, um, it forces us to just pause for a minute. We want to get to market as fast as we can. We want to make really great products. Sometimes in our rush to market, we lose sight of um, that gap, intention versus impact. Great, you've got good intentions, but who might this influence? Um, so... Uh, Airbnb's example that applications for guests with distinctly African-American names are 16% less likely to be accepted relative to um, identical guests with distinctly white names. Um, there's been uh, a number of uh, research studies uh, on that. And, um, you know, it's, it's not what the folks at Airbnb intended, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem um, that has to be addressed right away. So thinking about the way that we design products, we've got to get in the habit of following up on the outcomes of our best intentions. We do user research, um, you know, where we build a product and we test the usability and, and see what happens. When we're doing research, um, pre-launch and post-launch, we need to be thinking about the diversity of those that we're testing with um, so we can stay connected to those outcomes. Better yet, if you can co-create with a number of customers, um, that can help you see things ahead of time. The second question in um, the Project Inkblot framework 
designing for diversity is what it's called. How do the identity, identities within your team influence and impact your design decisions? Who's in our team? If we don't have diverse teams, if we have very homogeneous teams, um, again, we might have good intentions, but a very narrow set of life experiences that lead us to grossly overlook um, really central things. Um, and that can lead to really unintended consequences um, that, that are not acceptable and they could be super de detrimental to your company um, if you don't get that right. So thinking about, you know, fundamentally building diverse teams uh, that represent lots of life experiences. Um, you know, of course, race and gender are things we think about, but abilities, um, various abilities uh, is, is another thing that we should consider. Even economic background, you know, people coming from privilege versus those who didn't have privilege growing up are going to have different perspectives on different problems that you're trying to solve with your products. Question number three in that framework is who might we uh, be excluding? Who might we be excluding when we think about our product design? Um, and one way for us to really pinpoint that is by creating all people statements. An all people, people statement looks like this. All people can express themselves in their messages using emojis. Is that true? It wasn't that long ago that that wasn't true that emojis were not representative of all the various people on the planet, which is surprising. Um, you know, there, there are uh, a lot of things that we miss in our illustrations that might be in our products or in our marketing, um, the way that we ask questions, the way that we build forms, and we might have to ask information about gender and relationships. Um, and we might not think about people who aren't, you know, uh, binary in their, in their gender. And that makes people feel profoundly sad and, you know, unseen, like they, they don't belong. Um, it, to me, this is, this is as central to designing for emotion as anything there is. Um, I'm actually the father of two African-American boys. This is uh, Bellamy um, in the gray uh, zip up hoodie there and Olivier, these are, these are my boys. And, um, you know, seeing the world through their eyes and seeing the world, um, you know, with them, I don't have that shared experience of being, growing up black in the United States, um, which is, you know, heavy thing and uh, difficult to, to be a parent in that situation and not always feeling like, um, you know, I can give them everything that they need. Um, it's, it's shown me that, you know, this idea of belonging, um, there's just so many places where it's absent in our world, you know, like, uh, parents put band-aids on boo-boos. Um, there have been multiple times where I've reached for a band-aid or someone's handed me a band-aid and it is a band-aid for white skin. So it stands out and looks strange on my kids. Um, or, you know, playing a game, uh, like Candyland in the living room on a Sunday morning. And we look at the board uh, with all these illustrations of characters. And I said to my boys, I said, look at all these illustrations. They're all white people. Who designed this game? And they said, a white person designed this game. Think about what it is like to go through life, through the world, um, of not seeing yourself of people like you in um, movies, in books, in games, um, in products, you know, that someone has not considered your presence. Um, feeling unseen is a, a profoundly negative emotion. This is Diogenes Burrito. He's a designer at Slack, and he's a great designer um, who found himself in a difficult situation. Um, he was working on a, a simple ad campaign for Slack about, uh, you know, adding Slack buttons uh, to other products. It's sort of an API hook thing. And um, there, he was working with a standard set of illustrations to build these little ads. And this, the stock set had a white hand. Um, and he said to himself, you know, I don't want to make this a thing 
because it's not a thing, but actually it is a thing. It's the right thing to do. I, I want to change the color of that hand. And he had to, had to contact um, a colleague, a white colleague and say like, Hey, can I have that source file? Um, I need to change some things on that. Uh, so that created an awkward moment. Um, and it was a simple thing. Again, this is not like a profound um, highlighted piece of the product, but it went out in the world and um, people noticed. Uh, people of color saw a brown hand and said, wow, hey, um, I, I'm uh, you know, so used to seeing air quotes, flesh colored hands and graphics. And um, this just kind of caught me off guard. And it, it, it is a small thing, but it matters. It feels profound to feel seen and like, um, you know, like you belong, uh, you belong in, in the world. Um, this Diogenes burrito, uh, why was the, the choice an important one and why did it matter to the people of color who saw it? The simple answer is that they rarely see something like that. These people saw the image and immediately noticed how unusual it was. They were appreciative of being represented in a world where American media has the bad habit of portraying white people as the default and everyone else as deviations from the norm. Another Airbnb example, working on their illustration system, um, they've been very thoughtful about how they represent different types of people. And it's not just about race, uh, it's also about gender, it's also about abilities. Um, and you know, showing, showing the real world, this is what real people look like. Why can't we represent real people um, because those are the people who are using our products and, um, you know, whether it's our marketing or our help content or um, whatever that is, people need to see themselves in that. Um, they should be able to see themselves in that. That feels, that feels um, essential and right. I want to talk um, lastly about the, the business side of emotional design. Um, there are a lot of uh, methodologies and things that we can do, but how might we think about folding this into uh, the business itself? Sam Altman uh, from Y Combinator, uh, love this quote, it's better to build something that a small number of users love than a large number of users like. Designing for emotion in an agile world can be complicated because we want to move fast. Um, we want to um, not slow down and think deeply about, you know, the broad um, spectrum of, of possibilities because we want to be quick to market. Um, we put a thing in the market and we iterate and dial that in and we pivot and so forth. I think there's a lot of entropy uh, that comes from that uh, over index on speed without the careful thinking. I often say that speed without the right trajectory is entropy. You're just burning cycles. You're just burning time. So understanding trajectory is really important. Um, you know, this is, I've worked with a lot of, of, uh, developers over the years and, um, uh, I've, you know, partnered and said, you know, I think we should stop and think about emotional design and, and the way that this product is perceived. And um, often the pushback I get is that's nice, but um, we can add that after we build our MVP. I want to challenge the way we think about MVPs though, because MVPs feels like there's just a flaw in our thinking about what an MVP is and what it, what it can be. Um, think for a minute, when you download a product on your phone, for example, um, and you try it out and it sucks and you delete it, how often do you go back to the app store to download it again? We're probably a special group of people because we're product people. Uh, we might go back, but the percentage of us that do, it's pretty small. It's, it's not very many. So that first impression becomes so important. So when we think about MVPs, instead of thinking like, what's the, the least amount that we can create in terms of functionality and building that pyramid from the bottom up, we'll get to emotional design later. We should think about a slice vertically. 
that we're building something that is functional, that is reliable, that is usable, and that is emotionally engaging, that recognizes emotional needs of our customers. Human beings will use our products, and when we design things that, that acknowledges those people's humanity, they're more successful products. They're products that um, circulate by word of mouth. They're products that are sticky. They're products that are memorable. They're more successful products. That's why we're in this business, right? That's why we jumped into the revolution that we want to be able to make a thing that's successful. We have good intentions and we want them to, uh, to you know, we want our products to help people. So emotional design can influence business performance in a number of ways. We saw earlier an example of Headspace. Headspace probably would not have been successful in creating their category had they not designed for that emotional experience that people are coming to this with self-doubt, with stress, with anxiety. How might we diffuse that and make them feel more comfortable and more welcome? Customer acquisition and retention is something that um, Wealth Simple has done uh, incredibly well. Um, it, with their marketing website, um, you know, bringing people in and giving them a sense of trust in, in what they're building and retaining them um, so they, when a bear market hits, that they don't dump all of their um, holdings and, and close their Wealth Simple account. Duolingo um, is a, a really great product for learning other languages. They use uh, emotional design in a number of ways to increase the session length and uh, bring people back to the product on a regular basis, so return rate. I know this one very well. I saw this firsthand, you know, starting um, building this business when we just had a few thousand customers and when I left in 2016 after eight years of my life working on this product, we had millions of customers. Now, 65% of marketing emails are sent through MailChimp. 65% growth and market reach. Um, there's a lot of things that you know, we worked on uh, and I think we've, we figured out with MailChimp. One of those central things that was key to our growth and our market reach was the way that we designed for emotion. Slack is a really fascinating story. Um, you know, Slack is... Uh, a company that had a strong competitor when they entered the market. Atlassian had HipChat. Um, many of us were using it. I was using HipChat. HipChat was a great product. I mean, it was like it, it did, did the trick. But there was something about Slack that felt fun and approachable and different. Andrew Wilkinson, uh, who heads up MetaLab, uh, which is the agency that Slack hired to work on um, the product early on, um, he wrote about this. He said, when you hear people talk about Slack, they often say it's fun. Using it doesn't feel like work. It feels like slacking off. Even when you're using it to get uh, you know, stuff done. But when you look under the hood, it's almost identical to every other chat app. You can create a room, add people, share files, and chat as a group or direct message one another. Totally true. You know, if, you, if you put Slack versus uh, HipChat back to back, very, very functionally similar, reliable, usable products. The difference was at the top of that hierarchy of needs. With Slack, a buddy, bright UI, um, delightful interactions and hilarious copywriting come together to create a personality, a personality which has triggered something powerful in its users. They care about it. They want to share it with others. It feels like a favorite coworker, not a tool or a utility. So, um, you know, just recently published numbers, 10 million daily active users, 85,000 paying customers, 13 billion uh, market cap. I know that these numbers are low because uh, this came out a few months back. Um, in a nutshell, what happened was Slack came into a market where a highly successful company had already cornered that and they de dethroned that company. Um, HipChat, as we probably all know, Atlassian let it go. They tried to create a separate uh, a product after that that didn't take on. And they finally just said, Slack, you got it. It's, it's yours. How do we integrate emotional design into our process when we're designing products? Step one, 
investigate the emotional needs of your customers. Be connected with them. Don't just talk to the same homogenous group of people. Talk to a lot of different types of people um, and spend time with them in their home space, their uh, workspace, or their third space, like you know where they hang out. Of course, that's not easy to do during a pandemic, so post-pandemic advice for you. We can use tools like, um, uh, you know, um, these uh, emotional design maps, uh, empathy map, uh, end of the day here and I'm <laughs> reaching for it. Um, think about, uh, you know, when you're talking to your customers, you can start to build these models about what's going on in their head. You know, how do they think and feel? What are they seeing in their environments from their friends and so forth? What's their attitude in public? What do they say and do? What are they hearing from others, from their boss or influencers? What are their pains and gains? We start to talk to people. We can map this out with uh, empathy maps. Um, very simple thing to do, and it's a great way to kind of gather that information and bring that back to your team, your studio, and um, start to think more deeply. Great set of tools from Mattermind Studio. Um, Emotion Centered Design Toolkit. And these are a bunch of um, research methodologies and tools that can help you tap into the emotions of your customers um, and start to think about how those things factor into your product. Step two, map the customer journey, right? We think about these peaks and valleys. What are they? You know, some of those valleys might be as simple as like, Hey, this is just not very usable. It's a clunky form design. We can improve that and make it clearer. Some of those things might be places where pre people are bringing fear, sadness, mistrust to your product, and you can address those. You can meet people where they are. Peak moments, you could celebrate with them. Um, you can extend that moment in, in uh, creative ways. Finding those moments. It doesn't have to be a massive project. Um, when you map that journey, you can start to identify those moments, whether that's a peak moment of the high five or it's a valley moment where, you know, you're acknowledging someone's loss. And step four, consider how to measure the impact of the moment. We come to our work with good intentions, but let's make sure that we're connecting our intentions to those outcomes. And we know what's the worst case scenario, what that impact and on whom? Just scratching the surface, there's a lot to the idea of designing for emotion. Um, we've got time to talk and I'm happy to chat with you about it. Um, of course, I, I invested a bunch of time um, writing a book um, all about this topic. And um, you know, I think that um, coming into this industry with this revolutionary idea and finding ourselves in this moment where we need to reflect on the places where maybe our ideals fell short. Um, that's something that I want to do in my work, but um, I hope you'll join me on that journey too. I think there's a lot that we can do to improve what we're making and just better serve humanity. Um, so we can serve not just delight, but all emotions. Thank you so much for coming out this evening and look forward to talking right now. Well, awesome, Aaron. That was a great talk. Thanks so much for giving us some highlights from uh, your new second edition of your book. Um, it's great. A lot of great uh, resources and nuggets in there. So we appreciate it. <music>